Shall we turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 15. Paul the Apostle, having received the glorious knowledge of Jesus Christ, having been delivered from the bondage of darkness and brought into the glorious kingdom of God, felt a debt to all mankind because the gospel of Jesus Christ had done so much for him, had made him so rich in spiritual things that he felt like he owed all men at least to share with them this glorious good news. And so he speaks about, I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians or barbars, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am a debtor, therefore I am ready to come and to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now it is important that we not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In Mark's gospel chapter 8, about verse 38, Jesus said, And whosoever would be ashamed of me in this sinful and adulterous generation, of him shall I also be ashamed before my Father in the presence of his holy angels. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. That's quite a statement for a man who was stoned in Lystra, chased out of Thessalonica, secreted out of Berea, imprisoned in Philippi, mocked in Athens, all for the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the Greeks, he said foolishness. And yet he declares, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, of course, comes from the old English good spell. And it is good Tidings in the Greek, the, the word translated gospel. I am not ashamed of the good tidings or the good news of Christ. And what good news Jesus Christ is to a lost and hopeless world. I find myself deeply moved at the ineptness and oftentimes to me stupidity of our judicial system. I have a friend who I have known for many, many years His mother attended our church in Prescott, Arizona. He was a minister before I was, and that was an awful long time ago. He had gone to Inglewood to speak in a church. He was sitting out in front of the church reading his Bible before the service and before going in when two men walked up to his car, shot him in the back, took his watch, $10, and his credit cards. He was killed instantly, and the two men were apprehended, having his wristwatch and having his credit cards, 
and each one accused the other of being the trigger man. Both denied shooting, both said the other one actually did the shooting. Because the courts could not decide which one did the shooting, they were both set free and are now free out on the streets somewhere tonight. Because they could not rely upon the witness of each other, and in spite of the fact that they both admitted the crime, had his credit cards and watch and all, when apprehended, yet because of the ineptness and previous rulings of the courts concerning what testimony is admissible, these men are free, but a good friend of mine is no longer preaching the gospel. I read this morning in the paper of a woman who was driving home in their old station wagon in Compton. Her husband was in the car with her and six of their children, four of their children. When her husband said to her, lock the doors, because two young men were approaching their car as it was stopped at a red light, the men came up to the car, tried to get in to the woman's side, couldn't, broke the window on the man's side, drug him out, shot him twice in the head, and went running away without taking anything. And she, there in the street with him dying, the children, of course, screaming, tried for several minutes to flag a car to stop, to help her. No one would stop. No one would give her any help. That's here in Southern California, both incidents. The one was in Compton just recently, the one in Inglewood a few months ago. And when I read of things like this, and I look at this world in which we live, and I see the direction that things are going, I feel sort of sick down in the pit of my stomach. When I realize that crime is on the increase, when I realize the light regard that people have for other people And for other people's property, I sometimes think, oh God, how long can you allow these things to go on? How long, Lord, before you put an end to it? I read of these things that are happening in the world, and I read the slanted press and the... Uh, you, you see how they're manipulating people as far as world opinion, public opinion. And you think, God, how long can you allow these things to go on? Since the beginning of our nation, 1,222,000 men have died in war. Since 1776, nine million babies were aborted in the last four years. We think, oh, it's horrible. Men have gone to war and they've died. Oh, what a shame. What a crime. You know, how terrible. War is so horrible. You wonder, oh God, how long? And then this rising epidemic of child abuse. Four hundred and 
fathers, stepfathers abusing their daughters or their stepdaughters. Taking advantage of little children, six, seven, eight years old, ten, eleven. My heart cries out, Oh God, how long must we endure these horrible things? In all that I see around the world today the threats of war the threat of famine the threat of epidemics social epidemics physical epidemics In all of this, I know of only one real hope. And that's in Jesus Christ coming and taking us out of this whole mess. And my heart begins to yearn for that day. I know what Paul meant when he said, We who are in this body do groan, earnestly desiring to be delivered. Not that I would be unembodied, but I, when I might be clothed upon with a body which is from heaven. And I look at my little grandchildren, and I think, Oh God, what kind of a world are they growing up in? And will there be food enough for them when they do grow up? Will there be a world that is fit to live in? If things are this bad now and are deteriorating so rapidly, getting worse every day, you wonder, what does the future hold? And that is why I am so committed to the good news of Jesus Christ, because I am convinced that it is the only good news in the world and it is the only hope for this world in which we live today. Paul the Apostle said, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ, of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. God's power to save man from his sin. God's power to change a man's life. God's power to deliver us from the bondage of corruption. It is interesting that the Greek philosophers had concluded that salvation was impossible. They said once a man had fallen, once a man was lost, there was no hope of his recovery. Salvation was impossible. And that became the conclusion of the philosophers. And of course they used to have the proverb, can a leper change his spots? In other words, it's just a part of your nature, you can't change it. You are what you are. And you cannot change your nature. You've been born with certain pre kind of dispositions to certain attitudes, to certain characteristics. And there was no salvation for a man once he went down. There was no lifting in mud. But Jesus Christ came along and declared something totally revolutionary. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to lift up those that were fallen. He came to give hope to those who were living in the abyss of hopelessness. 
And Jesus Christ proclaimed that man could be redeemed and reclaimed and have a whole new life. And that which was impossible for man and by man became a reality through just simple faith in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. It was God's power, the dunamis, the dynamic by which God could change a life. And it matters not what the past may be. It matters not how far you may have fallen into sin. It matters how, not how deep your psychological traumas or scars may be from childhood experiences. God can change your life and give you a whole new life and a whole new purpose of life, a whole new meaning in life. And that is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. A man can be changed by God's power and become that which God intended him to be in the beginning. Man who has been lost and stained by sin can experience that power, that dynamic of God in his life. And that's the thing that keeps me going. The power of God in changing people's lives and the glory and the blessing of seeing these changes. I think as a minister you probably face some of the seemiest things in the world. I mean you hear stories from the bottom. Sometimes as you are listening, you cannot really believe what you're hearing. As people relate of things that have happened to them. The depth of depravity into which man has fallen. And it's depressing many times. To hear these stories. And yet, a minister, I feel, has some of the greatest rewards and glory in the whole world because we also hear those beautiful stories of what the power of the gospel has done in changing lives. And the letters that we get and the testimonies that we hear of lives that were wrecked, lives that were ruined, lives that were on the rocks, and of how God by his power has come in and made the transformations and made the changes, restoring homes, restoring marriages, restoring lives. It's just absolutely glorious. And sometimes you think, that you're just going to float home because of the glory of God's power in changing lives. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. How thrilled I am with it. How thankful I am for it. The power of God unto salvation to those that believe. Now, Paul is here getting into the theme of the book of Romans. A lot of times in the symphonies or concertos or whatever, they start off with just a big crescendo of noise. And then after a few bars, they, they get into the theme. And you hear now the theme. This 
came from the fact that many times a pianist would sit down to play a composition, everybody would be talking, chatting amongst each other. And so he'd start off just with some loud chords to draw people's attention. And then as soon as he had their attention, he would start off into the theme of his composition. Now Paul sort of began his epistle by attention kind of things, greetings to you in Rome and all, and I've longed to come to you, and, and I've been praying for you and all. But beginning with verse 16, he starts to get into the theme, the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe. And the message that Paul is going to be proclaiming throughout the book of Romans is God's power to save on the principle of faith. Not of works, which everyone was geared to in any religious system. For in every religious system there is that aspect of man's works in order to please God and be acceptable by God. If this is, if you want to be pleasing unto God, if you want God to accept you, then this is what you must do. This work, this work, this work, this work, this work. Now that's all well and good as far as it goes. Yes, God would be pleased if I would do this and this and this and this and this, but my problem is I can't do this, this and this. I want to do it. I recognize I should live that way. I recognize that's right. I recognize that I should be sweet and kind and generous. I recognize that I should never lose my temper. I recognize that that's the way a person ought to live. Very giving and very generous and very good. but I can't. I don't have the ability. When I would do good, evil is present with me. And that good that I would, I'm not doing. And that which I wouldn't do, I find myself doing. And so, trying to please God by my works is frustrating and it brings me into defeat. Because though I desire to do those good works that would please God, I long to live a better life. More consistent, more considerate, more generous. Yet I find that there is within me an opposing force that is very natural it is my own self-preservation instincts and me first instincts that keep me from being and keep me from doing that which I would do and desire to do that I know God wants me to do in order to please Him. So every religious system of man leads man into frustration and into emptiness and into a guilt complex. Because they point the right way, they show me what I should be and do, but yet I don't have the ability or the capacity to live up to it, I fail. The failure of man's religious systems. And so God has established a new covenant whereby the power of God is revealed and manifested through faith in God and in His Son, Jesus Christ. So that by believing in Him, 
I now have the salvation, soteria. I am saved. Not by my goodness, not by my efforts, not by my works of righteousness which I have done, but I am saved tonight because of what Jesus has done and my faith in his finished work. Religions always emphasize the work of man. Christianity emphasizes the work of God. And this gospel that Paul is going to be declaring unto us is God's work for man. And he's going to show us what man is and what man has done. He's going to take us right to the bottom of the barrel. He's going to stir up the muck in the bottom of the barrel. He's going to show us what man, highly cultured, highly sophisticated, what man is and what man has done through his culture and sophistication. He finds that at the bottom of the barrel. And then he'll show us the work of God and the effect of that work of God in my life when I believe in it and that righteousness that I can have and that I do have through this new principle not of works but the righteousness of faith and so Paul declares I'm not ashamed of the gospel the good news of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And there you have the whole thing spelled out. God's power to save man demonstrated on those who believe. It's God's good news. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, the Jews have been promised a Messiah. A savior and therefore in order to fulfill his promise to the Jew God sent his only begotten son to the Jewish nation as their Messiah now the gospel basically that Paul preached was this he speaks about it in 1st Corinthians 15 1 how that Christ died according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ came bringing to the Jew the message of God's salvation, demonstrating to them the power of God and the love of God. The purpose of God in restoring man. So the work of Jesus while upon earth was the work of restoration. To the blind he restored their sight. To the lame he restored their ability to walk. To the deaf he restored their hearing. To the dumb he restored their speech. God's work of restoration. Making man what God wanted man to be. Whole, complete. But he was rejected. John tells us in very pathetic terms, he came to his own and his own received him not. But it was necessary that he come to his own in order that God fulfill his promise to the Jews. And Jesus' ministry was basically to the Jews, though on occasion he ventured out into the Gentile realm. He came basically for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But when they rejected then 
the door was open to the whole Gentile world. And when the Lord apprehended Paul on his way to Damascus, he said, and I am sending you unto the Gentiles. And oh, let's take a look there in Acts at, at uh, Paul's declaration of his call. Um, when he is rehearsing it, I think, before Agrippa uh, in the latter portion of Acts here. 26th chapter. Paul is telling Agrippa of his experience on the Damascus Road. Verse 12, he said, I was on my way to Damascus with the authority and the commission from the chief priest. And at noon, O king, I saw in the path a light from heaven that was brighter than the sun. It was shining all around about me and those that were journeying with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet. I have appeared unto you for this purpose. Here's the purpose. Here's why Paul was apprehended. To make you a minister and a witness both of these things which you have seen and of those things in the which I will yet appear unto thee to deliver thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send you. Paul was being sent to the Gentiles for what purpose? To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul's commission, fascinating commission, because he's declaring it to the Romans. This is what I was sent to do. To open the eyes of the Gentiles, to turn them from their darkness, into the light and from the power of Satan unto God for the purpose that they might have the forgiveness of their sins and come into the inheritance of those who have been set apart by faith in Jesus Christ. So this is the basic essence of the gospel that God has provided a new life delivering you from the power of Satan bringing you into the power of God and this new life to the Jew first. It came to the Jew first. He rejected. And God opened the door to the Gentiles that whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. For therein, that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith. So God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel that is received through faith. For the just shall live by faith. Now this is a lesson that God first taught to one of the Hebrew prophets who was living at the time of the decline of the nation just before its captivity. And this prophet sounded much like I did at the beginning of the message tonight in my lament over world conditions. The prophet Habakkuk said, Lord, please, I would, I would just as soon you not let me see anything else. I, I, don't show me anything else. I can see how justice is being perverted. 
I can see how corrupt men are destroying the nation. I can see how things are going down so fast. And God, you're not doing anything about it. Now, Lord, if you're not going to do anything about it, please don't show it to me. It just frustrates me. I get so frustrated reading certain magazine articles or newspaper articles, editorials many times, that tell of some deplorable condition, and yet what can you do about it? In the news tonight, there was a family who have a child that needs medical care, is in the hospital collecting Medicaid, costing the government about $6,000 a month. Now the doctors admit that the child could get better care at home and would be better off at home. And the medication and all for the child would only cost a thousand dollars a month at home. However, according to government bureaucracy, if the parents take the child home from the hospital, then they don't get any help. So the child remains in the hospital at six thousand dollars a month under inferior care. Because the parents can't afford the $1,000 a month to keep it at home. Though they want the child home, the child wants to be home, and the doctors say, oh, it would be much better off to be at home. Now that kind of stuff just frustrates me. I think stupid bureaucracy. It's strangling us. Thank goodness President Reagan put up a stink over the thing and now they're going to take the child home and give it care at home and the government's going to save $5,000 a month. I thank the Lord we have a president who has the guts to speak up on some stupid issues. Now he may be not doing so well in other areas but at least He has the courage when he sees something that's really stupid to say, hey, that's stupid. <laughs> and to get those bureaucrats turning a bit. So, we see the things that frustrate as Habakkuk did. And Habakkuk in his frustration complained to God and said, God, don't show me anything else. I can't take it. This stupid government bureaucracy is more than I can handle. It's costing more and more to get less and less. I read a horrible statistic the other day. It cost the government $40,000 to administrate $1,000 of welfare. Now that just upsets me. And that frustrates me. And I like Habakkuk say, God, don't show me anything else. I can't take it. The whole system, Lord, is bankrupt and we're going down the tubes. And Lord, you're not doing a thing about it. You're just standing by with your hands folded, twiddling your thumbs and not doing a thing about it. And here we're going under. And God spoke to Habakkuk and he said, Habakkuk, I am working. I'm doing a work. And if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. Habakkuk says, try me. <laughs> and God said, all right. I'm stirring up the Babylonians right now, and they are coming with their troops, and they're going to destroy this system. Oh, now, wait a minute, Lord. 
We're bad, but they're wicked. They're worse than we are. Why would you use a nation that is even more wicked to judge your people? The Lord said, I told you you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> so Habakkuk says, well, I can't stand it. I'm just going to go climb in the tower and I'm just going to sit there and wait and see what happens. So Habakkuk went up in the tower to just sit and wait. And the word of the Lord came to Habakkuk saying, Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. Man's works don't make it. Man's works can't make it. Man's works cannot bring him into righteousness. Man's works bring him into despair and hopelessness. I heard one of these brilliant philosophers the other day on TV. <laughs> and he was declaring, God is a creation of man because man needs to believe in something and it's important for man to believe in something. Thus it was important that man create God so he could believe in something. Because if a man doesn't believe in something, then there is nothing but hopelessness and despair. So even though God does not exist and there is no God, it's good for man to believe in God. And it was important that man create God so he could believe in something. Well, this is the end result of existentialism, the philosophy of despair, which concludes that reality is total hopelessness and despair, therefore you dare not live in reality. Take a leap of faith. Believe in something. Doesn't matter what you believe in. Believe in something. Believe in Santa Claus, the good fairy. Anything. Believe in something. It's important that you believe in something. Take a leap of faith. Leap into that upper story or else you'll die of despair and hopelessness. You go out and blow your brains out because there's really nothing to live for anyhow. So uh, unless you believe in something, it's just hopeless. So the good tooth fairy, marvelous. Put your tooth under the pillow and it changes into a quarter. Magic, mystical, marvelous. And thus the intellect of man expressing its highest achievements and attainments of thoughts. No wonder we'll get there. <laughs> Down towards the end of this chapter. Paul says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Oh, I can hardly wait to get to that passage. <laughs> the foolishness of man. But that's where you are. Men who deny that God has created them but declare that they have created God. Oh, what a switch. So that man becomes God and that's the ultimate of humanism, you see. Man is God. Man controls his destiny. Man controls his world. Man controls his universe. Man controls God, for man created God. Rather than acknowledging that God created man, but I have fallen from God's image. I have fallen from God's purpose and intent. 
I followed after my own lust and my own ambitions and they led me into a hell that I could not escape. But oh, thank God, he loved me anyhow. And he sent his only begotten son who died for my sins and has given me a new life and a new hope and a new reason. And tonight I am saved. I'm delivered from the power of Satan and from the darkness of that hopelessness of sin. And tonight I have a glorious inheritance in Jesus Christ. I have an eternity that is just set out and waiting for me for I've been saved I am saved I shall be saved put it in whatever tent you want to I'm there I have been saved from the past sin that I have committed my past is blotted out As far as the east is from the west, so far as God separated me from my sins. My past sins are totally forgiven. They'll never be brought up against me by God. I am being saved tonight by the power of God's Holy Spirit working in my life. He is keeping me. That power of God in me through salvation is delivering me from the power of sin tonight. And thank God I shall be saved throughout all eternity. And I look forward to that day when I am saved even from the presence of sin as I dwell in his kingdom of righteousness throughout eternity. And so saved is in past, present, and future tense. Someone says, well, are you saved? Yes, I sure am, thoroughly. From the past, from the present, and from the future. Or in the future. From the future judgment that is going to come against the sinner, the unrighteous. No wonder Paul isn't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Such power has been revealed unto salvation to everyone that believes. For the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And so God has established a new basis of relating to him no longer by works or by our works or our righteousness, but now we relate to God by our faith and by our believing and by our trusting in his glorious work. The righteousness of God revealed from heaven. Or revealed from faith to faith. Now, as we move into verse 18, what a contrast. For the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, but there is coming a time when the wrath of God is revealed from heaven and next week we'll look into that and to those against whom the wrath of God shall be revealed shall we pray father we thank you for that righteousness that you have revealed through faith unto faith that tonight we have been washed We've been cleansed. We've been sealed by the power of your Spirit. We've been changed. We've been forgiven. We've received an inheritance. We've been made children of God all by the work that Jesus Christ has done when he took our guilt and died in our place and rose again in order to justify us and to present us faultless before your presence. Oh God, how we glory in the work of Jesus Christ. How we thank you, Father, for this righteousness that you have revealed through faith, that by believing in him, 
we should be washed and cleansed from all of our past, from our present failings, and to be presented faultless in your presence with exceeding joy. Thank you, Father, that Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Thank you, Father, for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, your good news, and your power to save lost man. And now, Lord, may we live by faith of him, faith in him. God, let thy spirit just breathe new life into us and let faith grow and develop. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.